giants from the world of academia, three of our very own. So we have Professor Lynette Mitchell and Emeritus Professors Richard Seaford and Richard Stoneman. Um, the three of them are all interested in Persian history and um, in September, just before the start of term, the three of them went off on a trip to Iran. And so today each of them is going to tell us a little bit about their kind of experience of exploring the ancient sites in Iran. So I'm starting, and this is largely about holiday snaps. <laughs> um, but we hope we've got a little bit of, of content to put in around that. Um, can, is this the sound okay? Yep, sound all right? Okay. Right, well I'm going to start off to talk about um, Cyrus. I'm writing a book on Cyrus the Great of Persia, who was a, uh, who's sort of developed, as my empire students know, um, an empire in Iran and across the um, Middle East in the 6th century. Um, and uh, so I'm very interested in Cyrus, but I became quite interested in Cyrus's gardens, um, partly because of work I'd done before I went, but actually, actually going and seeing Cyrus's palace and Cyrus's gardens, or where they would have been, has sparked all kinds of ideas about how Cyrus was playing with ideas of kingship, because um, as some of you will know, the research that I've done in the last few years has been largely centred on kingship and ideas of being a king. Um, so what I'm going to start by doing, I'm actually not going to start in Iran, um, I'm going to start with just some general comments about um, kingship or Near Eastern kingship in general and two important motifs which will become important when we start to then think about um, Cyrus Palace itself. And the first one is this ideological position which Near Eastern kings seem to have had about royal inaccessibility. Um, this is um, a passage, it's from a Greek text. This is where it appears most because the Greeks found it slightly suspicious it wasn't something that uh, kings had to do, Greek kings certainly didn't do, or had a, a different kind of ideology of ruling. Um, but Near Eastern kings kept themselves locked away. And um, this is um, a bit from Herodotus about Diocese, who was said to be the king of the Medes in the 8th century. So that's the first thing, royal inaccessibility. <coughs> The second thing is the king as a gardener, um, and this is a motif that runs through a number of Near Eastern royal settings. This is a, a reconstruction of the hanging gardens of Nineveh, because it's now thought they weren't such a thing as the hanging gardens of Babylon, they've been moved to Nineveh instead. instead. But one thing that's quite important to notice about this reconstruction is that the gardens are high up on a wall, or on walls or on terraces, but they're set within an enclosing wall. And that's part of to, do, to do with this question of seclusion. So that the, the gardens, the royal gardens, were set within a wall that was inaccessible to other people. Um, and that's a, this is a relief, I think it's in the British Museum, so you can go and look at it. And this is, um, uh, which one is it? I think it's Sennacherib's garden um, from, from Nineveh. Um, and there's quite, you can see all the trees there and the elaborate um, terracing that's supposed to be going on. I'm too used to having one of the uh, uh, light pointers, so I'm not very good at that, but anyway. Um, and this idea of a garden has divine connections. And one of the places that we can see this is in um, Genesis, in the Hebrew Bible, where we have God walking in the garden. And there are people who want to talk about the sort of the divine consequences of having a king wandering around in his private garden. So, that's the Assyrian stuff, and the sort of general Near Eastern stuff. Now I want to talk particularly about Cyrus' palace at um, Pasargadai, now, Pasargadai isn't actually marked on this map, but it's down here, so, or down this part, not that far from Shiraz, <coughs> to, to sort of locate it. If you want to find Tehran, 
Tehran is up here. So what we did is we travelled down the side of the mountains here and sort of turned the corner at Shiraz. Now this is Cyrus tomb. Now one thing we know from our ancient sources is that Cyrus tomb was set within a park, was set within a garden. And um, if we look here, I really do need a point now, but this is looking down the stretch of the site where the palace was located. And one thing that's really striking is that there's not very much there. There is Cyrus II right down the bottom. There are a number of small villas over this way. There's a bigger structure here. And then we were standing <coughs> on top of quite a high built up um, area um, to, the, to one side of the whole site. So what was, this was Cyrus Palace. So what was Cyrus Palace? In fact, from excavations, we know that these buildings were connected by gardens. And we know that they were because we have the water channels there. And you can actually walk around, as I did, this whole area here and follow the route of the, of the gardens. Now, when the original excavators uh, excavated this site, they thought that actually it was only a very small part of the garden, which, uh, or part of the palace complex, was garden, with these um, pavilions set in it. Well, hang on, and there we are, that's, that is, you did get a holiday picture, a proper holiday picture, but this is um, the Garden of Finn, just to give you an idea, it's the same kind of setup as you find um, at the Sargadai with this gravity-fed water system, and it probably would have looked something like that. But what the, um, in the last 10 or so years, there's been um, further archaeological work on the site, and what they've discovered is that there is extensive irrigation channels, which are no longer visible on the surface, covering the whole area. So that was that funny <coughs> tower down there, covering all this area here. There is a lake which runs in there, and then further um, earthworks of various kinds which indicate channels and fences and various things going on. Um, forward a bit, so that the whole thing, the whole garden, was as extensive as this. So this is, I'm going to be able to take this with me, this is where we were standing up on that high um, uh, built up area and there's Cyrus Palace right down the end. So the whole area was in fact gardens and it would have been um, largely trees. This is actually from Persepolis because it, Persepolis had a garden as well, set within walls, and I think that's an interesting point. Um, but also lotus flowers, and all over, I read something yesterday was suggesting that um, there weren't flower gardens in this place at all. It's unclear whether there's flower gardens. There are flowers all over Persepolis, carved into the walls, and so it's likely that these were flower gardens as well. So Cyrus Palace, or Palace Priest, <coughs> was a palace that was a garden. <coughs> it had no wall around it. They've not found any archaeological evidence of a containing wall. So it's just a palace that's made up of trees. And why I have included this one is because this was, we, we faced one direction to take there, and there is some greenery you can see around the top of the hills, but then Richard and I turned around and saw this field of sorghum on the other side, it was actually quite striking what that looks like when it's just rising up out of the plain, and I think that gives you a sort of a sense of what this palace of trees would have looked like. Now why do I think that's also terribly interesting? apart from the fact that it's 
a palace, which is a garden, which I think is just lovely, is that there is a statement about power being made here. The ability to, to take um, you know, a fairly harsh environment and turn it into a garden. That's certainly what the Assyrians were trying to do, um, and uh, Cyrus would surely have been doing the same. And there was something too about a reflection of the empire, because one thing about the garden, or, or these uh, imperial gardens, is that we know that they had all the trees from the empire in the garden, and so the, the garden then becomes a way of thinking about empire. It's also playing with the idea of the divine, of the king in his palace walking in the garden, and that crossover line between being a king and being a god. And finally, and I think this is the thing that interests me most, because it's playing with the illusion of being inaccessible. These gar this garden clearly had, oops, that'll do, that one will do, where's it gone? Clearly, clearly had gateways through which one entered the garden, but there's no wall around it. There's nothing to stop you entering the garden except for the protocol of going through a particular route. So entering the presence of the king. But there's nothing actually or really to stop you walking around the garden at all. So I just love this idea of the walls of the garden or the walls of the palace being made out of the trees, but the trees are <coughs> the trees themselves create their own boundaries and their own limits. So they make an inaccessibility, they make their own walls, but at the same <coughs> time they are accessible. One could enter the garden if one wanted to. So these are my holiday pictures. This is what I got out of this fabulous holiday um, in Iran, which wasn't life-changing, it was just fabulous. And we, we had the time of our lives. So it's about uh, my time to be able to